Hello and welcome. I am Piers Ridyard, CEO of Radex, the decentralized finance protocol, a public ledger layer one entirely dedicated on decentralized finance. Today, we are going to be doing a discussion with the founder of Radix, Dan Hughes, uh, where we are going to be diving into some of the details around Cassandra, which is the research project that Dan is spearheading um, to answer some of the questions that need to be answered around implementation of Xi'an. Now, what you can, Xi'an is, is the um, part of our technical roadmap. So we have different releases of our public ledger. The first one starts with uh, Olympia, um, which uh, all of these are named after the seven wonders of the world. Um, Olympia uh, was where the, uh, the great um lighthouse was and so it's lighting the way towards the the first steps of our path that is a uncharted um uh ledger running um our sort of starting consensus model and our starting sybil model um and then that's going to be alexandria which comes out at the end of this year which is where we introduce um, a programming language entirely made for decentralized finance called Scripto. Uh, and then going on to next year, uh, we'll be releasing Scripto uh, execution environment on top of um, the public ledger, which is Babylon. And also Babylon starts to, and that's when you can build DeFi. And then Babylon starts to introduce um, the concept of um, uh, sharding as well. It won't actually be sharded, but the but the data model will start to reflect what where we will be ending up for our fully sharded, linearly scalable um, final final release, which will be Xi'an, which will be coming um, in a couple of years. And Xi'an um, is, uh, is is quite a complicated leap from going from a single sharded model to a multi sharded model. Now, Cerberus, our consensus algorithm, was built entirely around this idea of being able to um, braid together different shards and different nodes to be able to come to simultaneous agreement as to what the uh, state update is across all of these shards. Now, the Cerberus paper is a great starting point but there's a bunch of outstanding research questions that need to be that, that sort of need to be answered to be able to get to this sort of fully linearly sharding model and this is where Dan's Cassandra research really comes into its own which is essentially his ability to run ahead of the field and start doing experimentations not all of which will necessarily be used on the mainnet or but at least giving us indication of what the best implementation path for getting to this fully sharded um, fully scaled scalable model um, once we've got you know decentralized finance um, properly being built on top of Radix. So with that in mind, it would be great just, Dan, if you could just leap into sort of what your starting point with Cassandra was and, and sort of what, what, what the fundamental questions you felt needed to be answered first uh, through this research. Sure. So um, really the main thing that spawned Cassandra was we have we have our cross shard protocol which is cerberus which technically itself isn't the whole piece of the consensus mechanism right you can think of you can think of cerberus as being the global global consensus mechanism um but you also need kind of local consensus mechanisms for the validator sets right so in a sharding environment let's say you had you had two validator sets those those independent validator sets need some form of local consensus, um, which was um, penciled in as hot stuff, which is what uh, uh, Olympia uses. And then you've got Cerberus, which is the, uh, the kind of consensus protocol that manages the communication between those two validator sets so that they can agree on, okay, you guys over there, you're responsible for this piece of state, we're responsible for another piece of state, you need a protocol where um, those two validators can agree that any updates to those two pieces of state that have different authorities responsible for them can agree that all of the state changes, e even those that the validator set isn't directly responsible for, they can agree that, okay, you guys over there, it looks like you've done your job correctly. You know, you've got a quorum of agreement. Um, you send, send the proofs over. I can trust that you've done your part correctly. So then I can also make the changes, right? <clears throat> So it's kind of like it's kind of like um, me and you peers having having some piece of work to do, and the the rules of that work is well, if you do your work correctly, 
then I will commit to my work that I've done. And the same for you, right? You are like, if, if Dan's done his work correctly, then I will commit to the work that I perform. And if either of us suspect that the other hasn't done the work correctly, then uh, we throw away the work that, the, that we've done. Um, so that's kind of high level, right? And this, this concept of commitment is quite important important in radix right because the commitment is finality right it's a it's a it is a it's a network that has finality absolute rather than probabilistic which means yeah. that you can't go back and change history on a thing once you have committed to it so it's really important that that final commit that you are that that, that you're 100 sure that you're 100 sure have right. done what they said they were going to do yeah right um, and obviously, if you go beyond the bounds of, of uh, consensus mechanisms, right, then that can break. Um, so if the number of malicious or adversarial parties in your network is too high, um, then that can fail. So it's very important as well that the network continues to operate within the kind of bounds that have been set um, so that the, the safety guarantees, basically. Right. Um, I, I think that's the one of the points that a lot of people i see at least when i first got into consent into sort of like public decentralized ledgers i've been like yeah but like i don't want it ever to break and it's like that that's not it's, impossible. it's, it's yeah. impossible like it, it, it has to break and if you 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 know if those boundaries are well defined and known then they, they, they're your engineering tolerances, the same as for a bridge or for a lorry or whatever. You go, this is good for up to 100 tons. <laughs> You're like, don't yeah, put like 100 tons there, on it. <laughs> there, there, there are trade-offs there, right? So right. You, you can push that safety bound, but it usually comes at the cost of latency, right? right? So you can say, you know, we've got this bridge, in your example, we've got this bridge and it can hold 500 tons, but only one vehicle can go across it per hour. Whereas you've got this bridge that can hold 50 tons and 100 vehicles can go across it per hour. Um, so you can push those safety bounds very high, but it, it, it's always at the cost of latency and the number of messages that have to be sent around between nodes. Um, so the kind of the sweet spot is the kind of traditional bound of uh, 2F plus 1, where F is the number of faulty adversaries, uh, faulty replicas, validators in the network. That's usually the kind of accepted tolerance. If you want to go beyond that, then and it starts to get complex. You introduce latency and rest complexity and all this kind of stuff. Um, right, and, so, you, and and you end up going down a more probabilistic route as well. Often with that stuff, uh, not necessarily. No, you can you can you can do it deterministically as well. It just it just adds latency, um, yeah. which is which is you know like, like probabilistic. Um, if you ignore selfish mining and all those, all those kind of tricks, um, then you, you got fifty one percent, right? But there's a lot of there's a lot more latency there than you would have with deterministic, for example. Right. And it's not a strict fifty one percent because you can reduce that as well with various tricks. Right. Um, Network segmentation, for example. Not just that selfish mining as well. So I right. I mine a block and I don't tell anybody about it, and I mine another one and I don't tell anybody about it, and then. I tell the network and it's like, oh, we've got to undo five blocks because there's six blocks here. Um, so you can gain an edge there, kind of trends to, trends to 33%, which is kind of a hard limit unless you're willing to spend lots of complexity and messages. Um, so anyway, getting back to the question. Um, so really where, where Cassandra came about was there was two really, uh, fundamental questions that I had that um, I wasn't sure what the answer was to, right? The first one was, and probably the most important one, is what happens in the case of a sharded network if you have a liveness break, right? Now, live, liveness means where um, a portion of the network is no longer making process. So you're sending transactions to some validator set, but they're, they're not processing, right? Um, and this can happen if you have um, a high number of uh, adversarial replicas there. So I own, a, I own a bunch of nodes with stake, reputation, compute, whatever, right? I, I own a portion of nodes in that validator set, and I'm just refusing to do anything. Um, and in, in severe cases, that can completely kill live. So nothing will happen, right? And in minor cases, you, you add latency, so things take longer to go through. In the worst case, it just completely stops dead. Nothing, nothing happened. Um, and Can, this is because consensus can't proceed in a in in a 
in a network that is has finality as part of its consensus um, process, unless it has two thirds a two thirds of however you weigh weigh the yeah. Vote. So so in, in the extreme case, I've got I've got I've got over a third of of the stake in that network, and I just don't do anything. I don't vote on anything, right? So then the two F plus one, I've got F, yeah, I've got F plus one, right? So then there's only two F remaining, and the rule is, oh, I need two F plus one to be able to commit anything. Um, but if I'm just abstaining, then I, I, I can also cause a safety break with that potentially, but maybe I don't want to do that, right? Maybe that's just too destructive from the point of view of, of uh, an adversary. Maybe I just want to cause a bit of disruption, right? Um, so I can cause, I can just stop the network dead or a, a part of the network dead because nobody can vote anything through and so no progress happens. Um, and you can also, of course, get these if, say, say, say you had um, your validators that, you know, a third of them were in AWS, a third of them were on Google Cloud, and a third of them were at Azure, right? Um, so you've got diversity. A third of them were on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, you've got diversity in your in your in your population of validators, but they're all unfortunately hosted on centralized systems, right? If right. AWS goes down, then you potentially get a lagness break in 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 that particular set of validators, right? right. Um, which is why it's important not to run your validators on centralized systems. Just stick a node in your bedroom or something, right? Um, which, which is incidentally like why we on Olympia, even on Olympia, there is uh, the rewards are linked to your responsiveness to the nodes' responsiveness to uh, to voting rounds. Um, on consensus rounds and like it's actually quite aggressive and like if any node runner is wondering why it's so aggressive if you miss like a couple of rounds an epoch your your rewards can go down a lot as a validator it's because of this it's because accidental liveness breaks can happen not because anyone malicious actors are in there but mm -hmm. because people have not built their their own node hardware or, or like set up to be redundant enough to be able to deal with things like um, you know, th simple things like a services, services going down or a DNS issue or something like that, which can cause these synchronous, like accidental synchronous events. That means that a third of validators by, by stake weight suddenly are not voting on a round and you get, uh, you get, you can't progress. Uh, and so, so part of our incentive design, even now on our network is, is very much around this pushing people towards high availability nodes, because that's a really important thing about ensuring that liveness continues on the network. Yeah. So, so the reason for this concern was, well, if you want to have, if you want to have a deterministic finality that happens quickly, then there are no consensus protocols out there that can do that, that also have any kind of liveness guarantee whatsoever, right? Um, it's just the liveness guarantee is as long as you've got less than F um, faulty replicas, then you should be live, right? That's about as far as it goes. Um, but the problem is, of course, is that in a permissionless environment, say you have an accidental liveness break, and if it's truly permissionless, then you can't get on the phone to all of the validators and say, hey, can you just kind of restart your machine? Because you maybe don't know who they are, right? In a permission environment, it's not too bad because everyone's permission. So you probably have some details about who those people are. So you can, you know, kind of fix the problem by a conference call, consensus by a conference call. Um, yeah, that, well, that's fine. Good. That's fine in a permissioned environment, right? Or uh, um, you know, those, kind of, those kind of configurations. But in permissionless, in she, and you might have, 20, 30, 40,000 validators, um, you know, you're not going to be able to call all those guys up and say, can you just press this button? Um, so, and there are no, there are no um, uh, consensus mechanisms that have the ability to give any kind of liveness guarantee under those conditions um, available right now. There are, there are kind of, they're kind of bolt-ons and stuff and like things like finality gadgets and all this kind of stuff, which they, they kind of work, but um, they're very complicated and it's more of a bolt-on. Um, really what we need, we need something that is kind of just just naturally gives some kind of liveness guarantee. Um, and it, do, it doesn't need to be a strong liveness guarantee, just something comparable to like Bitcoin, because Bitcoin's liveness guarantee is, is weak, but weak is better than not. 
right? So, so like with, with Bitcoin, you have a liveness guarantee that progress will eventually happen somewhere, somehow. Um, but it's weak because if you lost 50% of, of your miners, then um, your progress will essentially half, right? So instead of 10 minutes of block, it become 20. If you lose all but one of your miners, then you'd get a block, you know, once per day. But it's, it, it's live, right? It's still live. It's just extremely late and so. Bitcoin's liveness guarantee is weak, but under extreme conditions, that that's okay, right? It's better to be weakly live than never live again. Um, right. In the case where you know F had disappeared and they never come back, um, so that's the first thing really that the um, kind of spawned Cassandra um, because hot stuff doesn't have any any liveness guarantee at all under those conditions. Can, um, can, I, can I just pull out a couple of things there? Because there's a couple of things that I think are really important conceptually to sort right. of like understand. And I found them fascinating when I sort of started to dive into it. Like the reason this is, as I understand it, the reason this is difficult is because your F um, uh, or, or your validator set is determined through civil protection mechanisms like staking. And your staking mechanism is how you determine... <clears throat> you know how you determine what is consensus on the network so it's the way of securing consensus <clears throat> and so you shouldn't you like in principle there shouldn't be a way of unilaterally adjusting who has who's staking what however you then have this 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 problem that is presented, which is that if f of your validator sets by stake disappears, so a third of your validator sets by stake disappears and your network now can't progress, what you actually need to do is say, well, that F is no longer part of the validator set. I'm going to reduce hmm. my validator set by a third. But you can't do that if you're not live. But you can't do that if you're not live. So what you then need to do is push uh, uh, an update to, 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 to everyone, to the, no, to, 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 the, to the node runners, and they need to update their software where F has been re removed. And this is what Dan's sort of talking about when you talk about consensus via um, conference call, because you end up in this, what's called the social coordination. Yeah, and like yeah, social yeah. coordinations, you know, this is, this, is not, this is not an unusual thing for networks to do. Uh, that, like surprisingly not that unusual for networks to do. There's a social coordination uh, thing for Cosmos, for example, which is a uh, safety preferring network. Uh, and there's social coordinations for things like Stellar and stuff like that. So like the, and, and EOS famously had to do it many times when it first, when it first went live. Um, so the, like, there are hacks around it, and well, so they're naff, though, aren't they? I mean, they, 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 they are. They, 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 they're, they're naff, and so like what 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 Dan's principle here is going. Well, we, we can hack it, but we'd rather not. Let's 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 work out a way forwards that we can do this in a way that na the network is naturally able to progress, even if it's limping progression for a bit of, for a period. But then. Not. But then, but then you also then you have this counter problem, which is now if the network itself can decide who the validator set is, including based uh, like excluding nodes with stake, you suddenly have a secondary attack vector, which is now I can attack the mechanism that decides who the validator sets are based on stake, because I now I can create something that can exclude validators arbitrarily from the network. Um, and that that secondary consensus mechanism can end up being a point where you attack the network as a, as a way of reducing the total cost of attacking the network. Because if I only need you know a quarter of the stake in the network rather than a third, if I can also coordinate this attack, now it costs me less to attack the network. So you have all of these like things that you have to balance against each other to work out what the best way forwards is. Yeah, it's it's complicated. It's why consensus mechanisms there's not a great deal of them fundamental you know, mechanisms, right? Where you have these kind of broadly, broad capture, you know, determinist, if you've got a quorum of things, right? Or you've got probabilistic and it's based on this probability of something happening via a collective of, of individuals. Um, and that's really what most consensus mechanisms fall into, those, those two camps, right? You've got probabilistic and you've got deterministic and that's it. And, uh, the, the kind of research with Cassandra was okay. Let's just can forget you, can everything. You, can, you, can you just define those two terms? Yeah. What's so, a probabilistic consensus mechanism. So, deterministic? so deterministic consensus mechanism is where you have a collection of of validators, right? 
and they all see something and they all vote upon that thing, right? Also known as a multi-decree, right? So you've got multiple entities that are attesting to or against a particular thing, right? And usually the bounds are 2F plus 1, right? So 67% uh, of the network, if you had 100, 67 uh, entities would have to agree, yeah? Uh, depending on your consensus mechanism, that, that can sometimes be less. I think, I think for example, Ripple is uh, 20%. Um, so, you know, it depends on the consensus mechanism works. But generally, 33, 34%. Oh, sorry, 67% of my work. 67% um, have to agree, right? So, and, and that gives you an explicit agreement as well, which is, which is why you can get finality quickly because you've got an explicit cryptographically secure attestation to yes or no on a particular thing from a supermajority of entities that are involved in consensus and have the right to vote. Right. Probabilistic, <clears throat> probabilistic uh, refers more to um, the safety, right? So deterministic, uh, consensus mechanisms give you an explicit absolute safety. This is either committed or it isn't. It either accepted or it wasn't, right? And once it's accepted or, or rejected, you can't go back and change it, right? The decision is final. With probabilistic, you don't have an explicit um, commit. You have an implicit commit, let's say, right? And the reason for that is, is because there's a probability that what the network has just ex accepted, something better can come along and undo that change, right? So proof of work. If I've, if I've created a block with a particular number of uh, difficulty, then UP is my, by chance, hence the probability, create a block that is stronger than mine. So at the same time, I might do it at the same time, right? So I'll tell a bunch of, of, of notes about mine. They'll go, oh, yeah, they, yeah, that's the, that's the strongest one I can see right now. So they'll accept it. Um, but then, and you tell a different bunch of nodes yours, and they see yours, and, oh, yeah, this is the strongest one I can see. Then as those two blocks propagate across the network, you'll then start to get overlap where you'll have nodes that see both. It's like, well, hold on, I've got Dan's, but now I've seen peers, and peers is stronger. So the rules say I have to switch to peers, right? So that's why... So, so in that case, any transactions that were in my block were would be, would be undone. And if you hadn't included them in your block, for argument's sake, because there's a big mempool and you've just included a different set of transactions that you thought were the best ones to go with next, then the transactions that were in my block are undone until some point in the future where they're included in another block. This is why when you you know you send money to Binance or whatever, right, some Bitcoin, you have to wait a number of block confirmations because there's a probability. Uh, and quite, uh, quite a high probability, actually, that um, a block that your your transaction is included in may actually get undone. That's hence why. But then over two blocks, it's a lot less. And then after three, four, five, six, after six blocks, it's essentially it's essentially nil. But it could still happen, right? Right. Which is um, why which is why finality pref preferring networks like Radix, I I find them cool because like five seconds, done. that's it. Yeah. It can't be reversed. Like no, it I won't know be it's reversed. Good. I know it's good. <laughs> um, like the the only thing that can happen is that in extreme cases you could have a safety break, right? If right. somebody has right, compromised right, right. the network. But even but, then, but but that's both, like both a, but that's like a final, right? That, like, both versions are final, but also that's a huge deal on a on a on a network of this type. Whereas like a, a reorg of reorg of of the chain on Bitcoin is relatively like if it's one block deep. It's, it happens, happens all the time. Right? It happens yeah. naturally. Yeah, yeah, it happens a lot. And like just, you know, one block, you'll get blocks that happen about the same time and they get propagated across the network at about the same time. I mean, there's a, if you, if you analyze the Bitcoin blockchain, there's, there's tons of kind of one block reorgs. Um, but then if you look at two block reorgs, you know, they're, they're exponentially less and then three and four and five and six the probability drops off really quickly. Um, and Satoshi actually explains it quite nicely with a little graph and some simple mathematics actually in the in the Bitcoin white paper. Um, you know, and it drops down to nil, almost nil, but it never hits zero. There's always a probability that someone can come along and go, Bleh, there you go. Yeah, uh, potentially there was so, there was you know Hal Finney's family is still running the longest block on on Bitcoin and we just don't know it yet. <laughs> could be, right? Could be. It could, well, I mean. <laughs> no, one of the ways that one of the ways that the Bitcoin got around was this was that it introduced checkpoints, right? So right. it introduced um, these checkpoints periodically in the in the Bitcoin core code. So you know every every major update revision, a checkpoint is updated that is 
hundred thousand blocks in the past or whatever. Um, so you can't, you actually can't reorganize the entirety of Bitcoin because you have these checkpoints in. Um, but you can still go back quite a long way. You know, you could, you, you could definitely go back a few months, and that that in itself would just cause absolute havoc because all right. the transactions are gone. Right, right. a transaction right. that that I sent six months ago for a Ferrari, I wish. Um, <laughs> suddenly disappears, and the guy that I bought the Ferrari off doesn't have his money anymore. But I'm still driving the Ferrari around. So, right. um, so yeah, not great. Uh, so that's probability. There's always a probability that it will get on door, uh, even though it trends to zero quite quickly. It never actually hits zero, um, and that is just the nature of probabilistic consensus, right? And the and the reason that that the reason it's cool is that it means that okay, you're trading off your finality guarantee. Um, for a much simpler communication mechanism, right? right. Um, there's, I, it's a single decree. Only one person is voting, and the person that's voting is the person that produced the strongest block in that round, right? That block height. Um, and if I want to, if I want to be the person that's 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 the leader, if you like, for the next block, I have to throw a bunch of compute at it. And there's a probability that I will win, and there's a probability that I won't, depending on how much compute I've got. Right. Um, and then uh, but the, it, big, the big difference, obviously, also being that if a load of nodes stop operating on the network, it will still continue to reach consensus. You have a weak liveness guarantee, right? Yeah. And you have a probabilistic safety guarantee. That's the thing. So Bitcoin favors liveness over safety, ultimately. Whereas your more traditional uh, BFT and deterministic consensus mechanisms, they absolutely favor safety over liveness. Um, but then gets us back to the problem, right? So right. we want, we need finality for, um, cross yard. Yeah. You can't do it without cross yard. Um, can't do cross yard well, without finality. You, can. Like, you, it, you, you can do it, but it's, it's not atomic. Um, and it, if you run into any edge cases, then right. the cleanup is, is a mess. The it's rollbacks difficult. are insane. It's complicated. There's lots of moving parts. More moving parts means more things that can break, have bugs in, etc. Right? right. So, for the only sensible solution is that if you if you want to do cross shard and, and and you want to do and you want to do large amounts of transactions, you know, DeFi, whatever, then the only way really is to have an explicit finality. So you've got to have that. But then, what what do you do about your liveness? And so that's that. That was the primary reason for for Cassandra. So the way that Cassandra gets around that, um, uh, and what I was going to say before actually is um, starting with Cassandra, it was just okay. Forget everything, right? For, forget forget Cerberus, forget Hot Stuff, forget Nakamoto. Just just start clean. Like what what is needed and what can do the job. What what do I need to build? And then the next question is: Is it possible to build that? Right? What are the things that I need? I need I need I need strong safety and I need liveness. Weak liveness is fine, but I need liveness, right? And I, I need atomicity across shards so that, you know, you don't run into the issues of uh, cross shards uh, commits not being atomic, like right, where they're asynchronous or semi asynchronous at least. Um, and it needs to be secure, right? It needs to be um, the problem that, that you mentioned about adjusting the validator set dynamically. What's the attack surface there? How do I, how do I cope with that? How do I deal with that? Um, and so it was just forget everything, right? Just start scratch and just follow the breadcrumbs and, and see where it goes. Um, so that's, that's why Cassandra looks very different to, to our, our main net code. It's, you know, it's not hot stuff. You look at it and you can't easily see really any elements of service in there, even though some of the principles are there. It's just whatever it takes. Um, so what Cassandra actually does, um, and I believe it's one of the first to do this, is it's a it's a true hybridization of uh, deterministic and probabilistic. Right. So ultimately, what the what the what the, the philosophy here is is that if everything's running nice and easy and the network is nominal then you have your explicit safety guarantee right and you have liveness anyway because you've got you've got progress for your safety but if if liveness goes away for explicit safety then you end up with weak liveness and probabilistic safety 
and this this just happens naturally. There's not like a switch gets fl flicked or anything like this. This just this just happens because these two consensus kind of models they're not just bolted on top of each other. They're they're interlinked, right? They they are they're properly pipelined. They complement each other, right? You can't just you can't say, well, I'll take the probabilistic bit in because I don't want that, and I'll just go with whatever. The, the deterministic model is the deterministic model won't work because it needs the probabilistic and likewise the probabilistic needs the deterministic model so it's, it's a true hybrid right so, um, you, can, you could you could potentially say this is this is a, a new class of consensus you've got deterministic you've got probabilistic and then in the middle you've got this um and being able to do that gives us a few interesting things right so obviously the first one is if you have um weak liveness, then you can always make progress, right? You can always make progress and your probabilistic, uh, your safety is probabilistic until a point where you are able to extract from that progress that's been made an explicit commit, right? Um, and so what you're able to do is going back to your kind of um, example of changing the validators around, your probabilistic phase is able to manage the validator sets in such a way where it's extremely difficult to target that and, and manipulate it because the probabilistic phase requires compute. It requires compute. So if I've got a ton of stake, it doesn't matter because my stake isn't important in the probabilistic phase. What is important in the probabilistic phase is compute. Um, my stake is important when I'm in the deterministic phase for voting, right? Vote weights. Um, so this is also why um, I've spent quite a lot of time looking at more efficient proof of work mechanisms because um, you could use, you know, the, the usual Bitcoin-like proof of work, you know, just simple SHA-256. And you could, you could drive that probabilistic phase with ASICs, right? You could just have SHA-256. You could say, okay, all you guys out there with ASICs, you can just bring those over to the network and you can, you can drive this probabilistic phase, and then when when something is is moved from the probabilistic phase into the deterministic phase, then you need some stake, right? Um, but obviously, A6 are very power hungry, so I've spent quite a bit of time on figuring out a more efficient proof of work mechanism um, that can that can provide similar levels of security um, depending on you know, size of network, um, but is much more efficient in terms of um, how you get to that proof of work. And it's a combination of like sortition and uh, combinatorial theory, which if you're a real geek, you can go and look. Right, which is basically like you can, you can, you, you have a set of inputs uh, and um, optimizing your output beyond sort of the first guess gets exponentially difficult. Kind of, yeah. It's more, it's more the, the top, like high level, the, the, and there's also an interesting nuance here as well, right? So consensus just always goes around in circles. It, it sends you dizzy. So <clears throat> let's say that we have, have this proof of work, right? And we have a set of validators. Um, and there's a sortition element to this proof of work. So if you've got 100 validators, then the sortition parameters of that proof of work from the, you know, the previous thing that happened, they define which of that validator set, say 10 of them, are are able to make a proof of work, right? But what happens if you have a liveness break within your liveness break, right? What happens if those 10 validators disappear? Yeah, no, then your sortition group's just gone and nobody can create a proof of work. So actually the way that the sortition works, it doesn't select explicitly that set of validators. It says, okay, the, these set of validators here, these have, the, the nominal proof of work, right? They have to create a proof of work that has 10 zeros, right? Everybody else, you have to create a proof of work with more zeros. So then if that set of um, validators disappears, <clears throat> the rest of the network, the, the rest of the validators in that set, if they realize they've gone, they can go into what I call a panic mode and all of them can attempt to create a proof of work. But the proof right. of work for them to create is 10 times more difficult than right. the proof of work for the other validators. And the reason for that, of course, is that you still, if you've got 10 validators doing a proof of work that's easier, you still want, say, say it's blocks, right? You Say your block target is 10 seconds. 
then if you've got 10 that, that are, are tuned to create a block in every 10 seconds, and then suddenly an, another 90 come in, then you still want to block every 10 seconds. So right. the difficulty needs to be nine times greater. Right. So it's, it's similar in, in, in principle to sort of the block difficulty tweaking that Bitcoin itself does. As exactly in, like, the same. It's exactly yeah. the same. But this yeah, is yeah. tuned against the the selected members of the sortition set, right? right. So so that's there's the baseline. The baseline is ten leading zeros, yeah. Right. And right. and uh, every sortition set, you have to create a proof of work with ten ten leading zeros. Let, anybody let's, outside let's, of that let's, sortition let's, set, it's much higher. Let, let's then, go let's go up a level because i think we've gone like right into the right into the into the the weeds of a of a specific implementation of the thing but conceptually let's just talk about how consensus under nominal conditions sure is, but the, 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 this is the, the, this is important to some other really interesting stuff that has dropped out of cassandra that i didn't even expect right so there's, there's this proof of work that drives the the um the probabilistic phase and really what that proof of work is driving is what is called proposals, right? Mm -hmm. So the validators in that sortition set and the validators as a whole, if they want to go and do the harder proof of work or they have to because the sortition set has disappeared. Um, a proposal is, is this is what I think should happen next, right? So I think these transactions are the best ones to go with next. And there's a proof of work on this proposal um, and I'm going to submit it to the network, right? So that goes out to the network and your validators may get a few of these from different places, right? So in the same way where you get like these sing single four blocks and stuff on, on, on Bitcoin, you end up with a tree of proposals, right? Um, and there's various branches of those proposals. So it's like um, a, like a pre-ordering of what the network should process next. It's, it's a, it's more of a, okay, this is what everybody in the network right now that's creating blocks thinks should happen, right? There's this right. branch and, and the validators that have created the, the proposal on that branch think that that sequence of events should happen. And over here, we've got a different set of validators that have generated some different proposals and they think that this set of things should happen, right? And, you know, it, it, it can get quite wide. Um, and, it, and if you're in a liveness break, it can get quite long as well. Um, so you've got these, you've got the, this tree of things that could happen. Right. It's like it's like these are all the possible paths. Right. And uh, the different possible universes there could be for this for this for this ledger right at this moment. Um, and me as a validator, I'll, I'll be I'll, I'll be collecting these and I'll be seeing these. And this is where the first first bit of my state comes into play. So I'll, I will look at this this proposal graph of all of these different proposals that are linked together. I'll look at the proof of work and and I that there's some rules that decide, OK, which which proposal or branch of proposals am I going to test my vote to, to say, this is the branch that I think we should process next. Um, we'll get to the detail of what those rules are, but they're kind of similar to Bitcoin in a way with some nuances. Um, <clears throat> so what you have with this, with this, with this graph is you get your validators voting with their, with their vote weight on, on, on these, on these different branches. And over a period of time, you'll get a convergence of validators that's greater than 2F plus 1 on a particular branch, or maybe even on a particular proposal, right? Greater than um, 2F plus 1 by stake. By stake, yeah, or right. reputation, whatever it is, right? But for our case, stake. Um, and once you have 2F plus 1 agreement on a proposal in a particular branch, you can take everything prior to that proposal on that branch, and you can then commit it to ledger, right? And then anything that wasn't anywhere near that branch, you can just trim that off because it's been agreed, it's final. And then more blocks, more proposals are coming in with proof of work and you're, in, and you're then building this proposal graph up from the last proposal that you just committed, right? Um, and so that's, that's how tightly the deterministic and the probabilistic is. The probabilistic is here's what everybody thinks should happen. And then the deterministic is here, this is what will actually happen, right? Um, and you can't remove one without the other. To the deterministic away, then you'd never get finality. If you take the probabilistic away, then you don't have um, this this proposal graph being generated. Right. So if if I if I relate that back in what I think I understand it, what I think is layman's terms. <laughs> um, Wait, you mean that wasn't layman's? That was... <laughs> um, I, I, I there there is a. The, for me to even write what I think 
the network needs to process, I have to do some work to do that. So I have to spend some compute to even say, this is what I think should be should be processed in what order. Yeah. But at the same time of doing that, my stake is actually already written against that proposal as well. So I'm doing some work, but my 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 stake weight is 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 with the proposal. No, so so you don't vote on your own proposals. You don't vote on your own proposals. Okay, okay interesting. Well, 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 you can, but you can't immediately, right? Right. Um, okay. Again, it's just it's just like. You could take it out and it would be fine. It would work. Um, right. But there are some there are some cases where allowing that, um, and if you're in a liveness situation, it can prolong the liveness situation a little bit. Just, right. just that simple tweak means that you can recover from liveness issues a bit quicker, which is right. obviously important. Right. Okay. So so you're basically it, it's the equivalent of first running to a location uh, and then paying for something. Um, and the, the two, and they're two separate, they're two separate processes. They're two separate processes, but um, you can't have one without the other, right? And, and so why, why is the, why is the, why is the, what is the, what's, what do you get for that compute that you don't get without it? Okay. So in the case of, um, so th this is, this is how you're able to adjust the, the validator set, right? In the case of a liveness issue. So every, every validator that has created a proposal that gets committed, um, they receive an increase in vote power, right? So in the case of a proof of stake, they'll get some tokens. In the case of if it was a reputation, they'd get some reputation, right? Um, so if me and you created some proposals that were on a branch um, and we had, we had no stake to start with, yeah, we do, so we can only create the branch, Everybody else is voting potentially on that branch. Once they get committed, um, our vote power goes, say, from zero to one, right? Now we can start to vote on things too. Everybody else might have thousands of, of, of stake, but we're at least in the game now, right? We've got some skin in the game. And then for every additional proposal that we create that gets committed to Ledger, then we get some more tokens or reputation or, you know, whatever your, whatever your civil model is for that. Um, so what I'm actually doing is I'm trading compute for vote power. I'm saying, okay, I think this should happen. Here's my, my lottery ticket with the proposal on it, you know, my proof of my proof of work. Hopefully that gets accepted and I will get some I'll get some tokens. And then I can also start to vote on things. I can vote on block proposals that go in. I can vote on um, uh, the correctness of execution of transactions that have happened. I can be involved in the cross shard stuff then as well. <clears throat> so so this is just this is just a very high level. This is how you essentially earn yourself. You let the network earn itself back up to a two thirds majority. Exactly. exactly. Because so, so, if, so if, if a load go offline and it pushes you below the two F to two F. So then the people that are left in the network are creating proposals, right? Their, their stake is increasing, which is diluting right. the F that disappeared because their stake right. is staying static. Right. right. So, so, so essentially, the more that disappears, the longer that the, the, has to be just doing all of this churn work until there's enough votes collected, sorry, enough stake collectively in the network for you to get back up to the threshold to be able to continue progress. Well, yeah, well, you still have you have you still have weak progress, right? Because it's backed by uh, probabilistic safety. So what's important right, to remember right. is is a branch that maybe hasn't been committed yet, but it's got. You know, all the all the remaining validators are voting on this branch, which is the best one, right? And the only thing they can't do yet is achieve a two F plus one or sixty seven percent majority. But if you think from the point of view of, of of the of the attacker, the F, right, that are lurking in the background, being all mischievous and devious. Um goddamn Fs. Goddamn Fs. They might be thinking, Oh well, you know, I'll just come back online now and I'll 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 just I'll just I'll just apply my will. Well they can't because they, they're one third, but two thirds plus one of all the computing in the network is back in this branch, right? So then you're into the, the Bitcoin proof of work problem. They've then got to do a shitload of work to even be able to catch up with that branch, right? And they've got only one third of the compute power, whereas two thirds of the compute power is now building on this branch. So they've got a lot more work to do um, and they've got to throw a lot more compute at it. So then it becomes a 51% attack here, right? To you have the probabilistic safety and you have the 51% attack. But the difficulty here, the difficulty here for them guys is that um, their 
their compute won't always end up in the, in the sortition group for each of these rounds, right? So they, they might not get the nominal amount of power to do on each round. They might have to do the 10x amount of work for each round because the validators that were selected in the sortition set for a particular block that they're trying to create to catch up, none, none of the F might be in there. So then they've got to do an order of magnitude more work or, or more. So it's sort of it, 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 I, 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 analogous to rather than identical to, but it's sort of it's almost like a random random subset sampling proof of work algorithm. Kind of, yeah. I mean, so, so essentially, what's happening is is the is the you, you still have these epochs, right? Right. Um, and 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 for each for each epoch, it's like okay, these these are the validators that uh, are in the network, and these are the validators that are currently live because I can see progress on them. Um, and so that's going to form the basis of my sortition set selection for the next you know n number of proposals or whatever, right? And then after a number of proposals, if, if the, if the, if the constituents of the validator set has changed, you know, some have gone, some have gone offline, some have joined, you know, they've shuffled around because some of them have got more stake now than they did in the previous one. Then that changes the constituents of the validator set. And then for each round, every single round selects a different sortition set for the next uh, proposal. Um, right. and. It actually, even though it's not designed to be a, a verifiable random function, it does actually meet um, the requirements to be deemed as as random. Um, right. So you know you, you you can run the various kind of randomness testing tools on the output of this, and it pops up as you know this is this is as good as random, and that's because of the proof of work element. Basically, very few people are going to understand why that's so significant <laughs> well if it's not verifiably <laughs> random then I, I as an adversary can pick any number out of my backside and i give it i'm able to present that as being random a true right. random number right when it actually isn't and if i can manipulate the random number and get everybody to agree that that looks like a random number then i can have quite a large amount of um influence right which is the inherent problem of any random subsampling algorithm for example like avalanche or, yeah. or or any of the other ones that use this kind of uh random subsampling so what you're basically using is you're using the addition of proof of work and the randomized sortition algorithm uh we will go into i think we'll have to go into that in a in another session um because it's really interesting but like the the optimization you're trying to get to here if i understand it correctly is we don't want to create a network that requires so like proof of work as a as a as a very is a, is, a, is a simple hammer but it's also a very wasteful one um, mm -hmm. and it creates a huge amount of environmental impact uh, i mean there are definitely bitcoin maximalists who will argue against me on that um but like it, overall, it's, it's it's incredibly it uses energy a lot of energy, consuming. right? It uses a lot of energy. Whether you right? think that it's excessive or not doesn't change the fact it uses a lot of energy, right? Uh, and so, like, you could just use the proof of work algorithm, but then your then your then the network is optimizing for something else. However, if you're able to come up with a faster uh, proof of work algorithm that works is able to work in a smaller time set but still create an exponentially difficult problem set for an attacker yeah. you can end up in this nice scenario where the solution comes up quickly it's difficult to attack and it doesn't require too much energy so you're not really going to it doesn't make too much sense ideally in the ideal scenario and obviously these kind of things need to be tested more but like you it doesn't make any sense to optimize for just that because there's all of the other aspects of the consensus algorithm as well such as the staking and the finality and yeah so so like the the, the proof of work was a, was a late addition to this i was just running it with just simple sha256 right and then and then i just had a few ideas you know poking around and you get some thoughts so oh, i'll try that out so i spent a bit of time um with that and um yeah i mean like so it, it the proof of work is very it's 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 favoring the honest and disfavoring the the dishonest, right um and it becomes extremely expensive um to overcome if you're dishonest and you're not in that sufficient set it gets it, like really I mean, i've crunched some numbers on it and it and, and in, in a in a network the size of Bitcoin, then you could argue that you know the security parameters of this proof of work 
are more than sufficient for what it's doing. Um, I mean, Bitcoin, in my opinion, is maybe excessively secure for what it's doing. It's using a, a lot of energy um, and you could, you could, I don't think that anyone's going to spend a hundred billion dollars to, to overcome Bitcoin, right? I mean, it just, it seems like a little bit overkill at this point, which is fine. It's just, you know, from a, from a pure security point of view, it's like, what is an acceptable metric of, of security here? A hundred billion dollars of compute to roll back six blocks just seems a little bit excessive. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, you kind of, what is an exceptional security metric? This, this, this is more than able to, to achieve that. It gets very expensive. And the other side of the, of the, of the coin, so to say, is that you're not just overcoming proof of work here. You go, you've also got to, you've got to have a stake too. If I actually want to control this network, if I've only got proof of work and no stake, then I could have all the compute in the world, but all I'm actually doing is suggesting to the network, Hey guys, do you want to go this way? This is where, this is where I'd like you to go. Right. And I can potentially force everybody to vote on that if, if my branch is strong enough. But then I have, I have no mechanism by which to be sure that I can, I can then um, perform a safety break on what was committed, right? Because everybody's accepted it, but I, I haven't got enough, enough stake to be able to manipulate that second round, right? And if I've just got enough stake to manipulate the second round but not enough compute, then I still can't enforce my will because I'm kind of at the mercy of everybody else to if my transactions go in that I want to double spend or whatever and they go in in the right order and that kind of stuff. I have no control there either, right? Right. And if you wanted to do a double spend, you would actually have to get the network to vote on a branch that has two conflicting transactions in the pre-proposal phase anyway. And so you can, you can catch it. Right. So um, the only thing I can actually do um, in terms of in terms of safety breaks is that I also I have to isolate the network from another partition, right? Right. So right. I, I have to cause a partition. I have to have enough compute to get everybody to agree that my will in both of these different partitions, yeah, I need to have fifty one percent in both, and I need to have at least um, uh, F one third plus one of the stake to be able to force some kind of safety break on either side. So the actual security parameters of the network overall, they, they're a lot higher, right? Because you've got your, your probabilistic phase, which you need to overcome, which takes a certain amount of compute, percentage of, of, of um, you know, there's, there's an F there, and then there's an F in the, in the second round as well. So. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit, just in, in the sort of the closing, the closing few minutes of this um, sort of fascinating first dive into Cassandra. Let's talk a little bit about the costs of it. Cause like it's a bit slower, right? Um, no, not really actually. So um, you've probably seen the demonstration I'm doing at the moment, right? The, the Twitter thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's a nice little toy. It tests a lot of things, um, touches a lot of stuff. Tweets are extremely complicated. Well, and when I say when I say slow, just so that people understand, I don't mean throughput. I mean the time it takes for yeah, a transaction to reach finality. Because yeah. like on these th on all of these things, throughput is a parallel parallelized function. So you know if something takes ten seconds to commit, but you're able to do a million of them all at the same time, you're still doing a hundred thousand transactions per second, right? Um, so 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 it's it. it throughput and speed are two different metrics and sometimes people call speed throughput which is not quite no, right no. um so i mean like okay so in in a shorted environment this is never going to be as quick as something that isn't shot right because you just I, I, everyone has all all of the state that's going to be updated you don't need any kind of cross shot communication or anything like that right so um in comparison to say uh olympia then the finality time is never going to be as quick as that because it's you just can't do it right right finality uh, time on olympia unless, hangs around less than a second <laughs> on, unless it just so happens that um that uh a transaction is completely contained within a particular set of validators right so right. it doesn't need to touch anything else yeah it's, it's cross shard but in the practical sense it just so happens by by chance that all the bits that are needed for that transaction just are all under the, the authority of the same validator set so then you'll get something like close. But in most cases, um, all, all the transactions will be cross shard. So there is definitely a, a finality latency increase, right? 
But if you if, if we're just talking simple state flip, right? I'm sending some funds from me to you, yeah. Then that's probably going to touch two validator sets, maybe three in the worst case, depending on on the, you know, how where the bits of state are and right. how granular they are and stuff, right? Um, now for comparison. On the, on the Twitter demonstration that I'm doing at the moment where I'm, I'm importing all those tweets. Tweets are really complicated. Tweets t- tweets have anything from five to 15 pieces of state um, and they're all cross shard, right? And that level of complexity, I, from I submitting that tweet to the network, it getting propagated to all the different places it needs to go to. The proposals are created locally and agreed upon and there's all the cross yard stuff and the execution and all the state certificates and things that happen to agree that this was that this was good. I get finality on a tweet in about 15 to 20 seconds on average. Um, now a state flip transaction is a lot simpler, right? So you, you can you can reduce that that time accordingly. It seems to be fairly linear on the number of shards touched versus how many how long it takes, right? So if you've got say 10 shards and it takes 15 seconds and if you're only touching two, then you're looking at best case three to five, right? Um, there's also a lot of optimizations that can be done, which I haven't done yet as well. So I can probably trim a little bit off that. But realistically, for, for most simple transactions, you're looking for five to ten seconds. Right. Um, I, I suppose the point I was making is that the the you don't the, the pre the pre prepare phase is not free, or the the, the pre uh, that there is there is still like that process of doing the work and deciding what needs to be proposed, and then and then actually and then actually the network voting on that with stake that. That process adds something to it, the latency. It does, it does. but you, you, you can you can optimize it a lot. Um, but again, it's you, all the optimization in the world is never going to make it as as quickly final as what Olympia is, right? Right. Um, Olympia is final very fast because of the way it works, basically, rather right. than getting into those details. So you're always going to have more latency here. Yeah. Um, and What's your later and your cost of latency is essentially two things. The first is um, massive decentralization, and the second is um, shard. Uh, cross shard, but with a huge amount of throughput. And so, like the, 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 these are always the balancing the balances you have you have to do. You have to you have but to. Go. Is, what's interesting here, right, is that even if we say stuck with hot stuff for Xi'an, the, the final latency would still go up because you've got the cross shard pop, right? right? So again, you would end up probably with you know five seconds plus for finality on the cross shard part yep. um so i mean it's not miles out um i don't really want to speculate how much faster i can get it um most of the optimization isn't really in the protocol it's more on the implementation and that that, that may give us a second or two and under under nominal conditions right um what what really matters here of course is you have liveness and the throughput is able to be ridiculous. <laughs> oh, and, and, and it's also worth mentioning, I suppose, in closing, is like this is not the only like um, line of research that we're pursuing. We're also looking at optimizations of hot stuff and leaderless hot stuff, and and making and making uh, sort of optimizing the algorithm we already have to make that into a cross uh, in, into a, a high throughput um, cross shard environment as well. You have some. Trade-offs that you have to do around liveness breaks that that Cassandra solves, and like so, these are these are all just like right. questions, not just um, of uh, it, it's all research that helps us get to a better and better network that operates in a wider and wider range of scenarios. Um, but like all of this is sort of does not preclude stuff. Like we we will take maybe take some of this yeah. stuff out of here and some of this some of stuff from our other research. The objective is always to get the best performing network for you know the optimization of security and decentralization while still getting throughput. Like those are always going to have some weighing that we have to do, and we will always trim it towards what the application we're building the network for, which is, you know, decentralized finance. And I, and I think that um, we will learn more about that as we get, you know, applications building on top of Radix. Yeah, like the, the, the two questions that I set out to solve was, was the liveness one. Um, and the other was around, you know, managing validator sets, not just what happens in the validator sets in a liveness situation, but how do you also shuffle them and how do you ensure that that shuffle is random and all that kind of stuff. Um, and Cassandra answers both of those, right? There, there are ways that we can do it. Um, 
and some of those ways may be may be applicable such as the the loudness break mitigation some of some of that may actually be able to be bolted onto more traditional consensus mechanisms so me and uh, professor stogie from University of California Davies have had a few conversations around how would you apply this to PBFT, right? Which mm-hmm. is similar in nature to to hot stuff. Uh, how would you remove the view change protocol there, which is another another kind of point of contention when you're dealing with permissionless networks and stuff. So, what our Xi'an will look like ultimately still is undecided. But the questions that have been, you know looked at can are there solutions for these and are there solutions that can be at least somewhat generalized depending on um the direction we need to take um those two those two critical ones uh, i have the answers for them right there's still a lot of testing to do on them there's still a lot of um theory to to write and build and test obviously i'm working on papers as well um so there's still a lot of work to do but my my confidence level that okay these two things that were giving me sleepless nights, you know, 18 months ago, whatever, they don't give me sleepless nights anymore, <laughs> which is good because I know there's a solution, right? I know there's a solution. You know, as you can see, the, the damn demonstration that's up right now is, is right. pulling in 150 on average cross yard transaction, uh, cross yard tweets per second. It's ingested probably about 400 million things by now. And that's just a damn prototype, right? Um, and it's, you know, it's, uh, Interesting. What a lot of people don't know about about that, about that as well is that it's 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 a hard stress test as well because um, about twenty percent of the things that go through there fail. Mm. So it's not it's not in on running under nominal conditions either because my feeds are only partial, right? So I I get replies and retweets for a particular tweet that I don't have in the feed. So that still has to undergo consensus because it gets submitted, but it fails as well. So it's actually simulating. It's not really simulating. It's actually it's actually handling a ton of failures as well. Um, I think I think in the next chat, it would definitely be good to talk a little bit more about what the implementation on top of Cassandra, the Twitter implementation on top of Cassandra is doing and why it's sort of interesting and how it uses the Cassandra protocol to, 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 to do that stuff. But it's been a absolutely wonderful discussion. Thank you so much um, for, for, for taking me through that. And uh, yeah, looking forward to our, our next session. Sounds good. Thank <laughs> you.